Cambridge English, first certificate in English, listening, sample test. I am going to give you the instructions for this test. I shall introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you will hear this sound. You will hear each piece twice. Remember, while you are listening, write your answers on the question paper. You will have five minutes at the end of the test to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. There will now be a pause. Please ask any questions now, because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer, A, B or C. Question one. You hear a message on a telephone answering machine. Oh, hi, it's me, John. Sorry to miss you, you must have already left for work. Look, I wondered if you wanted to come away for the weekend. There'll be about ten of us, including someone called Sam Brent, who says he was at college with you, and he remembers that you were brilliant at rock and roll. Uh, they've decided it'll be on October the 9th, Friday night till Sunday. Anyway, I I'll put the details in the post. I, I know you're busy at the moment, so don't feel you have to come, but just let me know one way or the other when you can. Talk to you soon. Bye. Oh, hi, it's me, John. Sorry to miss you, you must have already left for work. Look, I wondered if you wanted to come away for the weekend. There'll be about ten of us, including someone called Sam Brent, who says he was at college with you, and he remembers that you were brilliant at rock and roll. Uh, they've decided it'll be on October the 9th, Friday night till Sunday. Anyway, I I'll put the details in the post. I know you're busy at the moment, so don't feel you have to come, but just let me know one way or the other when you can. Talk to you soon. Bye. Question 2. You hear two people talking about a water sports centre. So, how did you like the new sports centre? <laughs> well, there's a wide choice of things to do. It's just that their advertisement said something to suit all the family. Uh -huh. I wish they'd had water games for the under fives. There was nothing really suitable for them. But you can learn to windsurf or sail and you have the freedom to go anywhere in the lake. Isn't that a bit dangerous? Uh, not really. Nobody's allowed in the water without a life jacket and a rescue boat is on hand all the time. Mm, sounds great. <laughs> it was. So, how did you like the new sports centre? <laughs> well, there's a wide choice of things to do. It's just that their advertisement said something to suit all the family. Uh -huh. I wish they'd had water games for the under fives. There was nothing really suitable for them. But you can learn to windsurf or sail and you have the freedom to go anywhere in the lake. Isn't that a bit dangerous? Uh, not really. Nobody's allowed in the water without a life jacket and a rescue boat is on hand all the time. Mm, sounds great. <laughs> it was. Question three. You hear a professional tennis player talking about her career. Are you ever annoyed by interviewers? Well, I'm often asked about the financial side of things. I don't mind, but I can honestly say for many tournaments, I don't even know what the prize money is. I just focus on playing to my full potential. They must find that answer disappointing. No, the ones I have a problem with are those who assume it's all about partying and gossip. I wish they'd ask about the real lifestyle, practising day in, day out, and getting from tournament to tournament. I probably do around a hundred long-haul flights a year. It sounds exciting, but it wipes you out and actually ruins your social life. Are you ever annoyed by interviewers? Well, I'm often asked about the financial side of things. I don't mind, but I can honestly say for many tournaments, I don't even know what the prize money is. I just focus on playing to my full potential. They must find that answer disappointing. No, the ones I have a problem with are those who assume it's all about partying and gossip. I wish they'd ask about the real lifestyle, practising day in, day out, and getting from tournament to tournament. 
I probably do around a hundred long haul flights a year. It sounds exciting, but it wipes you out and actually ruins your social life. Question four. You hear a poet talking about his work. I've been slowly writing more and more poems for kids over the last few years. Talking to young people in schools, which I've been doing for some time now, reinforces my belief that they need and want the same range of subjects that older people do. Relationships, work, family, etc. Often it's something that only emerges after my poems are finished, but quite a few of them in my new collection were first thought of as poems for adults, until I realised that they might work just as well or better for kids. But I hope it's a book that adults will enjoy too. I've been slowly writing more and more poems for kids over the last few years. Talking to young people in schools, which I've been doing for some time now, reinforces my belief that they need and want the same range of subjects that older people do. Relationships, work, family, etc. Often it's something that only emerges after my poems are finished, but quite a few of them in my new collection were first thought of as poems for adults, until I realised that they might work just as well or better for kids. But I hope it's a book that adults will enjoy too. Question five. You hear two people talking about a program they saw on TV. Did you watch that program about the Gobi Desert last night? I thought it'd be really interesting because it's a part of the world I know very little about. The photography was brilliant, wasn't it? Yes. You could really feel how harsh the life was there. Overwhelmingly grey, I thought. It'd be hard to feel cheerful living in that landscape. It was a bit short on facts, though, wasn't it? I don't think it was that kind of programme. They just wanted you to be amazed at the fantastic landscape. I guess that's why there wasn't much commentary. You're right. I hadn't thought of that. Did you watch that programme about the Gobi Desert last night? I thought it'd be really interesting because it's a part of the world I know very little about. The photography was brilliant, wasn't it? Yes. You could really feel how harsh the life was there. Overwhelmingly grey, I thought. It'd be hard to feel cheerful living in that landscape. It was a bit short on facts, though, wasn't it? I don't think it was that kind of programme. They just wanted you to be amazed at the fantastic landscape. I guess that's why there wasn't much commentary. You're right. I hadn't thought of that. Question six. You hear two people talking about an ice hockey game they've just seen. So, your first live ice hockey game. Glad you came. Well, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. But it was so cold. I had no idea that it would be like that. I wish I brought my thicker coat. <laughs> oh, that's normal. At least it was a really exciting game. Our team was doing much better than usual. Well, perhaps that accounts for the noise. I knew it would be loud, but it was incredible. <laughs> what do you expect? We have to support them. Well, I can say I've done it. Just don't expect to see me here next week. So, your first live ice hockey game. Glad you came. Well, I wouldn't have missed it for the world, but it was so cold. I had no idea that it would be like that. I wish I brought my thicker coat. <laughs> oh, that's normal. At least it was a really exciting game. Our team was doing much better than usual. Well, perhaps that accounts for the noise. I knew it would be loud, but it was incredible. <laughs> what do you expect? We have to support them. Well, I can say I've done it. Just don't expect to see me here next week. Question seven. You overhear two friends talking about a restaurant. I can see why people really rate the place. Yeah, they really know how to bring out the flavours in the different dishes. They also put a lot of thought into combining unusual ingredients. And as a restaurant, it's not too stuffy and formal. It's got a really lively feel about it. Perhaps a little too lively. It was quite hard to hear each other above the din. I'm not sure it'd be the place to come for a romantic dinner. Great food, though, and so visually appealing on the plate. They've made a lot of effort with that. It really adds to the experience, doesn't it? 
I can see why people really rate the place. Yeah, they really know how to bring out the flavours in the different dishes. They also put a lot of thought into combining unusual ingredients. And as a restaurant, it's not too stuffy and formal. It's got a really lively feel about it. Perhaps a little too lively. It was quite hard to hear each other above the din. I'm not sure it'd be the place to come for a romantic dinner. Great food, though, and so visually appealing on the plate. They've made a lot of effort with that. It really adds to the experience, doesn't it? Question 8. You hear a man talking on the radio. As a result of heavy snow, there has been major disruption to rail services this morning. A number of breakdowns have been reported in the west, with people stranded on some trains. In this region, blizzard conditions are making driving conditions hazardous. A severely restricted train service will be operating within the next few hours into the capital, and delays are expected on all lines in the south of the country. In the north, there is some snow, but services have been able to continue, with only a few cancellations reported. As a result of heavy snow, there has been major disruption to rail services this morning. A number of breakdowns have been reported in the west, with people stranded on some trains. In this region, blizzard conditions are making driving conditions hazardous. A severely restricted train service will be operating within the next few hours into the capital and delays are expected on all lines in the south of the country. In the north, there is some snow, but services have been able to continue with only a few cancellations reported. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a woman called Angela Thomas, who works for a wildlife organisation, talking about the spectacled bear. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Thanks for inviting me tonight. As you know, my main interest is in conservation and I'm lucky enough to work with lots of different organisations looking after animals both in captivity and in the wild. I'd been fascinated by all kinds of bears for a long time before I started working in this field, but it was the spectacled bear that really attracted me. Some people find it appealing because of its size and shape, and it's less well-known than other types of bear. But for me, I thought it was such a great name. It comes from the patches of yellowish fur around the bear's eyes, which grow in a sort of circle shape like glasses, although these golden markings vary greatly from one bear to another and may not be limited to the eyes. They can extend as far as the bear's cheeks or even chest. I'd like to explain what we know about this bear and why I find it so fascinating. It's the only survivor of a type of bear that once ranged across America during the last ice age. We thought that it was only found in certain places, in Venezuela and Chile, but I was thrilled to read some reports that suggested it might also be living in northern parts of Argentina and eastern Panama. It's quite difficult to find spectacled bears in the wild because they are quite shy animals and tend to live in a wide variety of habitats which can range from dry coastal deserts to high mountain areas above 4,000 metres. 
They are most commonly found in forests, though. Being such timid animals, they tend to come out at night, which is another thing that makes them difficult to see. Though, like me, you may be surprised to learn that they don't sleep all through the winter, as many other types of bear do. We're not sure about the actual number of spectacled bears that remain in the wild, but it's been estimated that there are only about 2,400 still around. The bears are endangered, not so much because they are hunted by other animals, but what I find really sad is the fact that humans destroy their habitat. Spectacled bears are quite small compared with other bears, and, of course, they do have other enemies. These mostly include mountain lions and jaguars, but they remain a smaller threat. The bears are primarily vegetarian, and their normal diet is tree bark and berries. On rare occasions, though, they eat honey, which I thought was just something in children's books. I was interested to find that they are incredibly good climbers, and one thing I found really funny is that they've been known to sit up in a tree for days. They make a platform. Why? I couldn't guess, but they're waiting for fruit to ripen so they can eat it. It's quite surprising that although they rarely eat meat, they have extremely strong jaws and wide, flat teeth. Very occasionally they do eat meat, something like birds or insects, though they like small mice best if they can get them. We're really trying to make people more aware of the bears, and we've made a television series about one man's efforts to make people understand the dangers facing the animals. He spent a long time in Peru studying them, and has published a very funny diary of his time there. I hope everyone will read it and support our efforts to help these fascinating creatures. So, are there any questions? Now you will hear part two again. Thanks for inviting me tonight. As you know, my main interest is in conservation, and I'm lucky enough to work with lots of different organisations looking after animals both in captivity and in the wild. I'd been fascinated by all kinds of bears for a long time before I started working in this field, but it was the spectacled bear that really attracted me. Some people find it appealing because of its size and shape, and it's less well-known than other types of bear. But for me, I thought it was such a great name. It comes from the patches of yellowish fur around the bear's eyes, which grow in a sort of circle shape like glasses, although these golden markings vary greatly from one bear to another and may not be limited to the eyes. They can extend as far as the bear's cheeks or even chest. I'd like to explain what we know about this bear and why I find it so fascinating. It's the only survivor of a type of bear that once ranged across America during the last ice age. We thought that it was only found in certain places, in Venezuela and Chile, but I was thrilled to read some reports that suggested it might also be living in northern parts of Argentina and eastern Panama. It's quite difficult to find spectacled bears in the wild because they are quite shy animals and tend to live in a wide variety of habitats which can range from dry coastal deserts to high mountain areas above 4,000 metres. They are most commonly found in forests, though. Being such timid animals, they tend to come out at night, which is another thing that makes them difficult to see, though, like me, you may be surprised to learn that they don't sleep all through the winter, as many other types of bear do. We're not sure about the actual number of spectacled bears that remain in the wild, but it's been estimated that there are only about 2,400 still around. The bears are endangered, not so much because they are hunted by other animals, 
But what I find really sad is the fact that humans destroy their habitat. Spectacled bears are quite small compared with other bears, and, of course, they do have other enemies. These mostly include mountain lions and jaguars, but they remain a smaller threat. The bears are primarily vegetarian, and their normal diet is tree bark and berries. On rare occasions, though, they eat honey, which I thought was just something in children's books. I was interested to find that they are incredibly good climbers, and one thing I found really funny is that they've been known to sit up in a tree for days. They make a platform. Why? I couldn't guess, but they're waiting for fruit to ripen so they can eat it. It's quite surprising that although they rarely eat meat, they have extremely strong jaws and wide, flat teeth. Very occasionally they do eat meat, something like birds or insects, though they like small mice best if they can get them. We're really trying to make people more aware of the bears, and we've made a television series about one man's efforts to make people understand the dangers facing the animals. He spent a long time in Peru studying them, and has published a very funny diary of his time there. I hope everyone will read it and support our efforts to help these fascinating creatures. So, are there any questions? That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about their visit to a city. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to H what each speaker liked most about the city they visited. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker 1 We spent a day exploring the shops and markets in the city and bought some souvenirs. Then we wanted to see some of the area outside the city and discovered it was easy to get to loads of places by train, including the mountains, where we were told there were great hostels. You can do bushwalks out there, and apparently the scenery is stunning. But it can be dangerous. We were warned to have the right gear and tell other people where we were going so we decided to give it a miss. Anyway, we weren't short of things to do in the city. We were spoilt for choice. Speaker 2 We were pretty tired when we first arrived, so we were glad just to relax. We'd booked late, and I have to say that the room wasn't the best I've stayed in, but we had a view of the lake, which was a real treat. We were really impressed by the forests and mountains around the city. We made good use of the swimming pool, though we were too lazy to go to the famous markets. We didn't take advantage of all the shows either. Lots of people told us how good they were, so that was a pity. And the theatres themselves were supposed to be impressive. Speaker 3 One of my main ambitions was to see inside the big concert hall. And in fact, we managed to get into a concert there, which was pretty special. The acoustics were amazing. The city was divided by a river, and getting round had its problems, especially as we didn't really understand the city plan. The best way was the ferries. I was really impressed that they were always on time and provided good views in the city. The trams were good too, and the local commuters seemed happy to chat to us and give us ideas for the best things to do and see. We didn't have time to do everything, though. Speaker 4 
Before we went, we couldn't decide where to stay. So many people recommended different places, and there seemed to be loads of different and unusual possibilities, like old traditional farms converted into guest houses. So we decided to move around and try something different every couple of nights. That worked out really well, and they were all excellent. Although we'd been told that getting round on the buses was easy and cheap in the city, we decided to rent a car so that we could get out into the countryside. We didn't want to miss out on the views driving along by the ocean. Speaker 5 Even though we had a city plan, we got lost several times, especially in the old town where the buildings were quite similar. Though I know some people say getting lost is the best way to get to know a city. We were never short of help, though. Some people were even prepared to walk with us to show us the way, and that was something I'll always remember. Our hotel was all right without being spectacular, and it was a long walk into the evening shows. We took a taxi most times. There was loads to do every day, though, and we certainly weren't bored. Now you will hear part three again. Speaker one. We spent a day exploring the shops and markets in the city and bought some souvenirs. Then we wanted to see some of the area outside the city and discovered it was easy to get to loads of places by train, including the mountains, where we were told there were great hostels. You can do bushwalks out there, and apparently the scenery is stunning. But it can be dangerous. We were warned to have the right gear and tell other people where we were going, so we decided to give it a miss. Anyway, we weren't short of things to do in the city. We were spoilt for choice. Speaker 2 We were pretty tired when we first arrived, so we were glad just to relax. We'd booked late, and I have to say that the room wasn't the best I've stayed in, but we had a view of the lake, which was a real treat. We were really impressed by the forests and mountains around the city. We made good use of the swimming pool, though we were too lazy to go to the famous markets. We didn't take advantage of all the shows either. Lots of people told us how good they were, so that was a pity. And the theatres themselves were supposed to be impressive. Speaker 3 One of my main ambitions was to see inside the big concert hall. And in fact, we managed to get into a concert there, which was pretty special. The acoustics were amazing. The city was divided by a river, and getting round had its problems, especially as we didn't really understand the city plan. The best way was the ferries. I was really impressed that they were always on time and provided good views in the city. The trams were good too, and the local commuters seemed happy to chat to us and give us ideas for the best things to do and see. We didn't have time to do everything, though. Speaker 4 Before we went, we couldn't decide where to stay. So many people recommended different places – and there seemed to be loads of different and unusual possibilities, like old traditional farms converted into guest houses. So we decided to move around and try something different every couple of nights. That worked out really well, and they were all excellent. Although we'd been told that getting round on the buses was easy and cheap in the city, we decided to rent a car so that we could get out into the countryside. We didn't want to miss out on the views driving along by the ocean. Speaker 5 Even though we had a city plan, we got lost several times, especially in the old town where the buildings were quite similar. Though I know some people say getting lost is the best way to get to know a city. We were never short of help, though. Some people were even prepared to walk with us to show us the way, and that was something I'll always remember. Our hotel was all right without being spectacular, and it was a long walk into the evening shows. We took a taxi most times. There was loads to do every day, though, and we certainly weren't bored. That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You will hear part of a radio interview with a woman called Rachel Reed, who works in a commercial art gallery 
a shop which sells works of art. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. This evening, in our series Careers with a Difference, our guest is Rachel Reed, who works for a small commercial art gallery. Rachel, welcome. Hello. Rachel, what exactly do you do? Well, there's two great things about working for a really small company. Firstly, you get to do a bit of everything. The other is that you can practically invent your job title. Mine is marketing manager, although I do a lot of other things too. It does describe the majority of what I do. So, tell us about your day. Well, it all starts with the huge pile of posts we get. We often get artists sending in photographs of their work to see if we'd be interested in exhibiting it. I learned very early on how to differentiate between the possibles and those which are unsuitable. But how do you tell? It might be the style or sometimes the subject matter is just not going to look right in our gallery. But more often than not, it's just that they're not of the required standard. The possibles I pass on to the gallery manager who makes the final decision. So you have quite a lot of contact with artists? Yes. Sometimes I spend nearly all day on the phone and about 50% of the time it's artists. I send letters explaining why we can't show their work. Some of them phone up to argue about it. I find those calls very hard to deal with. Artists we do exhibit also phone to find out if we've managed to sell anything and, if we have, when the money will be coming through. I don't mind those so much. Most other calls are from clients. We have a new artist exhibiting here every two to four weeks and before the show takes place we send out a catalogue to the clients on our database. Obviously, the catalogue's illustrated. Oh, yes. And as soon as the catalogue goes out, we start getting phone calls because people see something they like and want to reserve it. Sometimes they even buy things over the phone. The catalogue also contains a commentary about the artist, which I have to write and research. I try to find out what has influenced them, where they learn to paint, what the subject matter represents, that sort of thing... But I try to avoid quoting from positive reviews of their work. It's not meant to be advertising as such. So your job is not all administrative? Compared to a typical office, that side of it's quite minimal. That's why I can cope without an assistant. There are systems in place to deal with routine jobs. For instance, I don't have to send out the catalogues. The company which prints them also prints the envelopes and posts them. Another company takes care of the food and drinks when we have the opening of a new exhibition. And are you involved in other aspects of the business? Yes. We also offer a consultancy service for large companies that want to display works of art in their offices. I phone round companies, explain what we do, and if they're interested, make an appointment for the gallery manager to go and see them. It's interesting. The companies tend to go much more for modern or abstract art than people coming to the gallery. And the best part of the job for you? The really rewarding thing for me is that you never know how a day is going to go. Some days it'll be really quiet, other days it's really busy and you don't know what you're going to have to cope with. And there's the added bonus of working with really nice people 
And, of course, I have the pleasure of spending my days surrounded by beautiful works of art. So I can't complain. Thank you, Rachel. And now we'll move on to some... Now you will hear part four again. This evening, in our series Careers with a Difference, our guest is Rachel Reed, who works for a small commercial art gallery. Rachel, welcome. Hello. Rachel, what exactly do you do? Well, there's two great things about working for a really small company. Firstly, you get to do a bit of everything. The other is that you can practically invent your job title. Mine is marketing manager, although I do a lot of other things too. It does describe the majority of what I do. So, tell us about your day. Well, it all starts with the huge pile of posts we get. We often get artists sending in photographs of their work to see if we'd be interested in exhibiting it. I learned very early on how to differentiate between the possibles and those which are unsuitable. But how do you tell? It might be the style or sometimes the subject matter is just not going to look right in our gallery. But more often than not, it's just that they're not of the required standard. The possibles I pass on to the gallery manager who makes the final decision. So you have quite a lot of contact with artists? Yes. Sometimes I spend nearly all day on the phone and about 50% of the time it's artists. I send letters explaining why we can't show their work. Some of them phone up to argue about it. I find those calls very hard to deal with. Artists we do exhibit also phone to find out if we've managed to sell anything and, if we have, when the money will be coming through. <laughs> I don't mind those so much. Most other calls are from clients. We have a new artist exhibiting here every two to four weeks and before the show takes place we send out a catalogue to the clients on our database. Obviously the catalogue's illustrated. Oh, yes. And as soon as the catalogue goes out, we start getting phone calls because people see something they like and want to reserve it. Sometimes they even buy things over the phone. The catalogue also contains a commentary about the artist, which I have to write and research. I try to find out what has influenced them, where they learn to paint, what the subject matter represents, that sort of thing... But I try to avoid quoting from positive reviews of their work. It's not meant to be advertising as such. So your job is not all administrative? Compared to a typical office, that side of it's quite minimal. That's why I can cope without an assistant. There are systems in place to deal with routine jobs. For instance, I don't have to send out the catalogues. The company which prints them also prints the envelopes and posts them. Another company takes care of the food and drinks when we have the opening of a new exhibition. And are you involved in other aspects of the business? Yes. We also offer a consultancy service for large companies that want to display works of art in their offices. I phone round companies, explain what we do, and, if they're interested, make an appointment for the gallery manager to go and see them. It's interesting... The companies tend to go much more for modern or abstract art than people coming to the gallery. And the best part of the job for you? The really rewarding thing for me is that you never know how a day is going to go. Some days it'll be really quiet, other days it's really busy and you don't know what you're going to have to cope with. And there's the added bonus of working with really nice people... And, of course, I have the pleasure of spending my days surrounded by beautiful works of art. So, I can't complain. Thank you, Rachel. And now we'll move on to something else. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left, so that you are sure to finish in time.
You have one more minute left. That is the end of the test. Please stop now. Your supervisor will now collect all the question papers and answer sheets.